Well, good evening and welcome to the Cary Lecture Series for tonight. So before we get started, just a safety message. If you could look around, find the closest exit, should we get a fire alarm, please exit the building as quickly as possible and do not re-enter until the local firemen give us permission to do so. So for those of you, this is, I'm not sure, how many people here have been to a Cary Lecture before? Okay, great. So how many people know what year the Cary Lecture Foundation was formed, the Isaac Hayes Cary Foundation was formed? I didn't know this either. 1921. Yeah. So Susanna and Eliza Carey, two sisters, you've probably all heard about the two sisters. Uh, they never lived in Lexington, but they used to come here in the summers to visit. And as a result of that, when they passed away, they left in their estate the formation of the Isaac Hayes Carey Foundation in memory of their father. And it's that foundation where they had the vision to build this beautiful hall for public talks. Lexington's population was less than 7,000 then. And imagine having the vision back then to say, we'll build a beautiful hall to host talks on any topic other than politics and religion. Other than that, they wanted to be able to bring voices here for people to hear. And this is amazing because today we have podcasts. Today we, this is before TV, by the way, too. 1921 is before the TV came out. So before podcasts, before streaming, all that, they realized the value of bringing people together to share new ideas. So I am so, we are also happy to have you here because this is continuing a tradition that's over 100 years old now. Uh, we're an appointed committee by the town meeting here, all volunteers, consisting of Rita Goldberg, uh, uh, Maggie Pax, uh, Monica Galizzi, and myself, Kevin Oye. Um, but we do this out of the joy of being able to bring to you fresh content and fresh ideas. Tonight, we're fortunate to have Meghna Chakravati with us, and uh, we're going to have Maggie. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> and this evening, Maggie Pax, who's on our committee, will be her host and get to turn the tables and interview Meghna. Lexington is back, right? Wow. So, so many people here. I know. They, they are here to see you, and uh, <laughs> we're excited. You know, she was coming in the door. Megna was coming in the door a little earlier, and all of us were down here in the front, and we heard a voice, and we're like, she's here. We had no idea what she looked like or anything, <laughs> but the voice <laughs> is the thing that jumped out to us. So we're really fortunate to have Megna here tonight and to have all of you here as well. So this is an opportunity for the interviewer to be interviewed. Kind of turn the table a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> She's yeah. usually the one asking the questions. And what I'm going to do is kind of walk through some questions that I've thought of and that I've crowdsourced from all of you. And then, as usual, we'll be opening it up for all of your questions as well. Um, but we want to jump right into it, right? And I think On Point is a show that covers a broad range of topics. And I wrote down, you know, I need my notes. I wrote down that in the last three weeks or so, you have covered how much can sanctions on Russia really achieve, Amazon's entry into healthcare, show about the intricacies of occupational licensing. <laughs> I loved that show, actually. One of my favorites, why clownfish need darkness. <clears throat> and why losing parasites could devastate the Earth's ecosystem. So how do you cover all of these topics and sound as though you actually know what you're talking about? <laughs> okay. um, well, first of all, thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. This is, you know, you, know, you always have that um, quiet fear in your heart <laughs> that you will be the one that attracts nobody. No one, right? Or, or, or like that one person that Twitter stalks you will like show up. Um, but fortunately, that's not me tonight. <laughs> I just have to say, I just, it's a delight to see you all. Um, I don't actually physically get out of the Boston, Brookline, Cambridge triangle often enough. So it's a really a great pleasure to be here in Lexington. Um, and I look forward to hearing all your questions too. Uh, so. First and foremost, I do not have a lot of practice on being on this side of the conversation. Uh, 
Well, let me just put it this way. It makes me admire those people who say yes to us when we ask to interview them <laughs> ever more so, because uh, you are willingly putting yourself in a place of vulnerability, um, which we can talk about that a little bit later. But so how do we come up with those topics? Yeah, how do you come up with them? Is it you? Who do you feel like talking to, or what's the process? It's a combination of several things. Um, a lot of it has to do with what do we think is relevant right now, but not in a sort of straightforward way, because there are very powerful, well-funded media organizations that can do that, like frontline reporting, and that's not us. Um, but what, is, what are the unanswered questions about things that people might be thinking about? Um, and then also, you read a couple of shows we've done re recently that are in the delight and surprise category that I love to do, right? Because a, a program like On Point doesn't necessarily have a narrow remit, right? There are purely news-based programs, there are purely science-based programs, or you know, purely arts and culture. We're still a grab bag, so I like to throw in into that mix stuff that you wouldn't expect when you turn on the radio. So there's, the a whole, there's a category called delight and surprise that you use? Well, I just made that up. Uh, I literally just made up that category, but that's kind of the feeling that, that we want to have when we do those hours, when we do those shows. So the, is it not, is it not, am I not loud enough? I should do what? Thank you for telling us. Sorry, is this better? No, you're fine. Matt, oh, I'm okay, okay. okay. Mine is in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah, so okay, so how does that sound? No. You might need to hold it. I might need to hold it. Yeah. Hold it right here? Yeah. yeah. Really? <laughs> I can clip it on my chin. Ah, uh, yeah. Use Even it. better. Okay. Now, can you hear me this way? Hey. Oh, wow, they're clapping for me. <laughs> Cool. So, but the thing I'm wondering about, and I think a lot of people wonder, is how can you sound like you know these topics? I mean, <laughs> and maybe you do know them. I mean, maybe you really do know about clownfish and parasites. But when I listen to the show, I'm, I'm thinking, how does this woman know so much? Um, I don't burst my bubble if you don't. I, I have um, an incredible staff. Um, we, don't have, we don't have a large team, but there's me plus four producers and, and some technical and sound people. Uh, and of course, our, our boss, our executive producer as well. And they're just very um, intellectually curious, uh, kind of voracious researchers. And so once we sort of put a framework around the thrust of what the conversation is going to be, the topic and the areas, roughly speaking, that we want to cover. Their major job is to go out and do a ton of research, uh, talk to sources, read, whatever, and then they put together a packet for me, essentially, that I try to crack open my skull and pour it in um, every day. And so we do a lot of research and prep, excuse me, essentially. And then, I mean, to really take you behind the scenes, uh, during the actual show, so we, go, we do these layers of sifting of information in the run-up to any particular program. And then during the actual show, I, in front of me, I have a computer um, that has the Google Doc <laughs> open where all the notes are. And they've been like reorganized many, many times. Uh, and then if, you know, if there's a particular fact that I need um, that I can't immediately remember. I literally just control F it and look for the fact. Um, so it's a combination of research, organization, and then we try to be as nimble as we can during the show to surface those things that make me sound probably smarter than I really am. Well, I think it's really, it's remarkable because you, you can't predict or I can't predict where the conversation might go. And so then being of the moment, being able to kind of jump onto a new train of thought and to admit, sometimes when you, you know, when you guess that it's gonna go that way and it goes another way, I mean, that's pretty nimble to have happen in the show, which is just kind of a, a state of mind, I would think, that yeah. you have to be in when you get there. Yeah, and I think there was, there's probably two reasons for that, which I, I'm, first of all, I'm grateful that you noticed it, because I actually think that 
that's one of the strengths of, of, our, of the show that we try to put together. And it comes from two places. Like one is, my educational background is in science and engineering. And so there's no like, my mind growing up just wasn't trained to presume there was any one narrative. Right, like you just kind of make a hypothesis, test it, and your hypothesis could be wrong as often as it could be right. You know, so you got to go where, in the, you know, in in science you have to go where the data take you. In a in conversation you go where the data, i.e., I. like the information you're giving me takes you. Um, so that's one thing, and then the other thing is we're living in a world of such complexity that I think I hope. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I hope that listeners have a lot of forgiveness for when the host is like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> or I literally, I, have, I say this more often than I ever did before. Like, I literally will say, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, I can't follow what you're saying. So, um, so I think that's another, it's like a willingness to say it doesn't make sense. Well, it cracks open a window because if I'm listening and I'm driving or I'm doing something and I'm, you know, I'm not paying attention completely and I lose the train of thought or I just find it confusing to have you say, can you say that again? Or that, you know, it's not adding up for me. Tell me what you mean. I'll elaborate on it. It's, it's kind of a opening of the door for some of us. However, I wouldn't say that the audience of people listening to most shows is tolerant. Did you say tolerant and open and forgiving? Well, That isn't the America we live in, so... Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, so I would say they're, um, they're well, I, when I say they, I'm, hopefully I'm speaking about some of you <laughs> or in the audience, right, if you listen. Um, my presumption is that listeners have a tolerance, a higher tolerance now for a host who admits, I don't understand what's happening at this moment because I'm guessing that the listener on the other end of the radio probably doesn't either. Oops, we're getting another microphone. Oh, am I? Am I not? Much for AV check that we did. So. How, how's this? Is this better? Ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> should we so start sorry. All over again? We should start all over. <laughs> um, anyway, so I was just saying uh, that I think um, I like to try to be uh, not as authoritative as possible, but as knowledgeable as possible. But again, I am not going to pretend that I am the expert, the content expert in the conversation, right? And I'm not going to pretend like I understand all the complexities of any issue we're talking about, or even any narrow sub-slice of the issue we're talking about. So I, th I see my job is like trying to just keep pushing, and sometimes that just requires being like, I don't get it. So then, Let's think a little bigger picture, right? You're, you're planning these people, you're inviting guests weeks, months ahead. Very rarely months ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say, because what if a bank failed on, you had to cover that, right? You can't plan for these things. How far ahead do you have it planned? So the show, for people who have been long time on point listeners, you know, it's a very different show than it was before. And beforehand it was much more responsive, like something would happen and, I mean, I was a producer for On Point before I became a reporter or a host, so like we just turn things around and do stuff the next day. But the show, for all sorts of boring media reasons I could go into, it's quite different now than it was then. So we tend to plan about a week or a week and a half in advance. Wow. Or so. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, and I mean, short. the ones that are much, there's, sometimes we'll do special series that are like five shows in a row on the same topic. Those get a couple of months. Um, and then there's sometimes just certain guests which everybody wants to talk to, so we have to like jump into the booking brawl. <laughs> and those, that takes a, a few months as well. But on average, I would say it's a week, yeah. Wow, so you're digesting these briefing papers like the President of the United States every day. You're getting a your oh, briefing packet. I love that analogy. I've never thought of it. Yes, it's my daily security brief. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're turning it around immediately, and then you're just flushing it? I mean, like, you're done with clownfish, and that's it? Or Sadly, most of the time, yes. But I hope that there's this, like, slow accretion of knowledge that sticks in my brain that can, then can be useful the next time we may come back around to a similar topic. Great. Yeah. So then another thing that I'm curious about is... Sometimes, you know, you're not the kind of interviewer who just holds back, right? You don't let the guests kind of say stuff and, that, and not expect that they're going to get pressure to explain it, to be challenged either by you or by another guest. Have you seen that go bad? I mean, have you seen people not... Some people are very famous and they want to say their part and aren't necessarily looking for someone to 
persist and ask them these follow-up tough questions? Yeah, it, it has a few times, definitely. Um, I would say that it happens less now than it did because of the kinds of topics and the approach that we're taking, which is more repertorial rather than sort of crossfire type conversation. Um, but definitely, <laughs> it's for sure happened happened before. Yeah, uh, yeah. In fact, we're going to come to that uh, some examples of that a little bit later. Do you find that your team has to do a lot of prep of the the speakers, or do uh, they not, or do you not want them prepped? No, that's a great great question. So, a really important part of our process is something we just call the pre-interview. And it's a long, open-ended conversation, interview conversation that is on the record, actually, so we can use content from that conversation that the producer has with the guest. And this can be done several days in advance or whatnot. Um, and the producer then is not, not asking the specific questions that will be asked during the show. That never happens because we don't know what the questions are going to be, and we would never ask them in advance anyway. Um, but it's just like, how much does this person know? What's their view on this? When they wrote such and such, what did they mean? How do they talk? Will they be engaging to listen to? So, so I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call it like direct prep of the guest, but it's a way to sort of put them through their paces, if I could put it that way. Did you say you don't know what questions you're going to ask? Like I have prepared because, you know, <laughs> but you don't know? What we have is a structure. Okay. And, um, and the structure is really more uh, sort of topic and, and um, issue oriented. Like we, we know we want the show to cover certain things so that ideally by the end of the 48 minutes, if you've stayed with us, you, you, you feel like you may have come away with at least a couple bits of new knowledge. I mean, a kind of highfalutin way is we call it a journey, right? We want to take a journey. Um, but, the actual questions, they're never written out. Okay, so you're really relying on your ability to kind of be on your toes all the time to ask these questions. It's not a, you know, any way canned, because yeah. you don't want to have it be like lifeless. Yeah, I mean, do we have any sailors in the audience? Yes, right, so like you got attack over and over again. You're not gonna go in a straight line, but you'll go around the buoy eventually, right? So that's kind of what we do. So then, when you have people, and you did recently have, what was I listening to? Um, some folks talking about whether sanctions on Russia are working mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. These folks did not agree. They right? did not agree. Did you know that? Yes. And did you, um, do you have to coach people on civility, or do you hope for the best? <laughs> we do not, no, we don't, we don't coach people on, on civility. And, I mean, the thing is, is that... Um, in a way, I'm a little, I want to say I'm, going to, I'm a little disappointed what, by what I'm about to say. And what I'm about to say is um, the kinds of like fireworks that you might think would happen don't really happen that much anymore because um, people with that differing sets of views will not come on the radio together. That's a sad commentary. Yeah. So we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll have some civil disagreement, which is actually kind of what we want, but I don't, I, in a sense, it also doesn't really, sometimes it doesn't really get down to what um, the core of a disagreement might be. Um, but uh, most people who say yes, let's just be honest, to come on a show like ours, they're familiar with what public radio stands for. So they know what the, you know, they kind of know what the expectations are of them. And, uh, and so it usually works out. So it's a self-selection kind of... There is a self-selection bias. And it frustrates me, right? Because I would love to get a whole group of, of folks on the show who I think public radio listeners would actually benefit from hearing from in the context of a public radio type program, but they just won't come on. Interesting. However, you have had some moments of intensity. In fact, we're going to probably see if we can play a couple of those moments. Share what you're sometimes up against. Works. Not Kevin will advance it for me, if you don't mind, Kevin. Dr. Fauci, I have one more quick question here. Sure. But I hear you very strenuously trying to not answer a question here. I am answering your question. We don't know what that number is. And that's why I say, and you think I'm being evasive, I'm not. <laughs> Let's all get vaccinated and you'll know it when you see it. Last question. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. You're wearing me down, though, Megan. 
I, I, Mr. Gerard, I understand you're saying you're saying a lot of things, and I, if if I can just jump in here, I I'm, I don't I well I mean I I've heard a couple of thoughts here. I've heard a couple of thoughts, and I just want to ask you, I just want to ask you about uh, don't necessarily want to want to want to talk over each other. So so forgive me for doing this, but you you're, you interrupt me all the time. Well, you you've said a couple of very interesting things. I just want to explore them a little bit further here. You're you're missing the point. The technology doesn't. So I just want to get a couple of things clear. Are you equating a united United States court of law as being equivalent or worse than a Soviet court? I'm just saying that's the way the Soviet system worked. But yeah, we're we're talking about a, a state in the in the United States of I know, America. And you really haven't seen uh, don't know much about Oregon, do you? I actually uh, uh, grew up in Oregon. I lived there from really the time I was there. two to the time I was twenty three. Uh, in Corvallis, Oregon, in fact. And I know you spend a lot of time in Eugene, Oregon, so I know Multnomah County I, very, I, you know, very well. I would have pegged you as a Eugene in a, in a heartbeat. Actually, I said, Cor- I said Corvallis, sir. I said yeah, Corvallis. I know, but they're, they border, and it's, it's really the same ultra-leftist crowd. That's actually Antifa. Uh, let's be, let, let's Congressman, be just Hold a on. moment. We just raised, just a, we just raised transportation We are the moderators here. I will give you a chance we to respond. We just raised transportation in Chelsea. I will we give need you a to chance. recognize we will. that five years ago there was no silver line in Chelsea. I'm not the silver about line now goes to Chelsea to service Ladies and gentlemen, both of you, please, we will give you chances to to respond. We you will. Have to give us a chance to respond on time. The rules are a minute each plus moderator well, discretion. That's not what you've done thus far. We have, we have agreed to the rules in advance. I, that is not I, what you have done We thus will far. give you a chance to respond because part of our job is to press you when we hear answers that don't fully answer the question. So, Councillor Presley, I would... So, just a quick thing there. Senator Warren has said she voted for that act because she didn't want state-level Monsanto regulations. She wanted well, national-level regulations. I mean, there's context well, there. Well, you know but what? I do, she, this, I do is, want, this is a flim flam. Well, let me finish. This actually, is the kind of way politicians are. Actually, let me are. finish, if you could. Yeah. Well, to, well you shouldn't be defending her, though. You're defending her. I am not defending you her. You are. She voted for the Monsanto context. Protection Act. Let's look I, at it. She voted yay. I am offering context for that Well, why? Why not look at the because that's context. my job. <laughs> okay, so wait a minute. <laughs> Dr. Fauci, I have one more quick question here. Sure. But Fauci, I hear you very strenuously. So you say there aren't that many difficult moments, but yet we, <laughs> we heard quite a few. So tell us about that. That was over a 10-year period. But <laughs> Blood boil? I mean, do you get like... Oh, no. No, no, it never boils. It's kind of fun, actually. Um... So those were Dr. Fauci. That was Dr. Fauci at the beginning. Um, And then you heard a little bit later the head of the Iron Workers Union. Um, And then you heard uh, Congressman Michael Capuano. And then you heard pastor and former GOP gubernatorial candidate for in Massachusetts, Scott Lively. And I think there was another one there that I don't. Oh, Shiva Ayudrai at the end. also a, I think, Senate candidate. Yeah, so, so those were just, those are actually some of my favorite moments because, I mean, what's someone trying to hide when they won't let an interviewer just complete a question, right? So I, that makes me even more curious about what they're about, what they're trying to say or won't say. Um, but those are moments that have come, almost all of them, except for the ones with Dr. Fauci and the one with the iron workers, uh, head of the iron workers, or steel workers union, excuse me, um, obviously had to do with politics during election seasons. And um, they're just moments when one of two things happens. Um, one is I feel like, I don't ever try to ask gotcha questions. It's much more like, you said this thing that doesn't make any sense, and these other facts don't comport with what you say, so please help me understand. And somehow that's really threatening to a lot of people. Um, And then the other aspect of this is, uh, I, when I made this compilation, I did it for another talk, and I searched through hundreds of shows to find the woman who treated me the way all of those men did. And I couldn't find it. <laughs> so I do think there is a certain, I mean, I, I, it doesn't happen to me very often, but I do think there's a certain like, why is this woman asking me these questions and why won't she stop? So Yeah, occupational hazard. So the worst thing would probably be speakers who are like freezing their tracks. 
like somebody who made it through your screening process somehow or pre-work who just loses it, right? And then realizes they're on, you know, national public radio talking to Meghna Chakrabarty and they freeze. Has that happened? They don't, no one ever freezes, but people will like go down this, like we call it the, um, like the avalanche where they just, they start talking and it becomes this like nervous stream of consciousness that won't stop. I think I've done that. Right? And, and I, those are actually difficult moments for me because on the one hand, it is my job to rein things in and be like, well, let's get back on track here. But it, I still haven't figured out a way to do it that doesn't sound rude. So, um, and listeners really don't like it. They're like, they're like, you should have just let that person complete the sentence. I was like, the sentence was 750 words long. So I don't know how I could let them complete it because we only have 12 minutes, 17 minutes, and 17 minutes in the whole show. So it's not, no one ever goes silent. They just verbal diarrhea. <laughs> some people Sorry. Might, yeah, some people might be annoyed, but a lot of people are very happy if you do cut somebody off at that point and get things back on track. Because after all, people are listening to go somewhere. Right? Write me emails then, because the emails I get are from people who are like, you were so rude. Why didn't you let them finish talking? Yeah, well, it's probably <laughs> a family member, but yeah, I understand. <laughs> so this is, you know, this is not, I look back at your background, right? And I see that you had a science degree as an undergrad, and then you did a master's in environmental science here at Harvard, and then you got an MBA yep. from BU. Like, where in the bingo card is, you know, nationally syndicated talk show host? It was never on the bingo card. How did this happen? Like, yeah. what domino of events would have led to you doing this? Yeah. And, and by the way, just to, in, in defense of all scientists and engineers, technically my undergraduate degrees were in engineering. So, <laughs> so um, in, in civil and environmental engineering, actually, which is a really awesome combination. But um, it was never, ever on the on the bingo card. And I obviously, I grew up in a family of scientists and doctors and engineers. Um, and I thought that was my path. Actually, I really wanted to be an astronaut. Like, was, like that was my life's dream. Uh, even went to space camp and everything. It was like the most amazing time of my life. Um, but then what happened is once I finished my master's and uh, you know, I was gonna try to get a PhD to this day, <laughs> My father passed away last year, so I can't say he still says this, but he always told me, he's like, daughter, you're a wonderful person, but you never got that PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm so glad you see parental guilt uh, yeah. crosses all cultures. Uh, so um, anyway, after I finished my master's, I realized something. That like, I love the learning part, but I wasn't really like motivated to go out and get a job as an environmental scientist or, or an environmental engineer. Because so after a while, you, you have to like observe your own behavior. Your own behavior is telling you something about what you want in life. And so I was like, I guess I don't really want to do science or engineering when I grow up. I just love learning about it. So I, I took some time off and, you know, had my pretend wilderness year. And so then were you... You know, we're going to show some pictures of you as a kid, but like, were you the kid who was on debate team? Were you a kid who was at arguing at the dinner table? You know, what, what kind of a kid were you? Um, I was a super tomboy that climbed trees, got muddy, rode my bike, pulled tadpoles out of creeks, um, was uh, on the president of the astronomy club, uh, super obsessed with academics. Didn't really have a choice on that one, but I also loved learning. So. I, I, the, the whole debate conversation thing was never part of, I wouldn't say it was part of my identity or my interest growing up. How fascinating, right? To go from, I mean, the, the character, the, you know, the sort of stereotype of people in engineering and science is not of this, like, ability to have this verbal repartee be so much a part of it. You must have been the life of the engineering party, right? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't go to parties, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at a couple pictures. So hopefully this works. Let me see if I'm doing it right. Oh, yeah, that's my fifth grade teacher. Tell us For about anybody this. who's a teacher in an education, bless you, because my teachers have absolutely shaped um, my life. His name is Mr. Hart. Uh. Um, and uh, uh, he was my fifth grade teacher in Corvallis, Oregon, and that was the year that I fell in love with U.S. history and also fell in love with 
the aspirations of what it means to be a citizen of this nation because of him. I feel like I'm, gonna, I'm hearing a politician in your future. Me? <laughs> I'd be a terrible politician. You have to like, like being around people, right? <laughs> I sit in a glass box, Maggie, alone. <laughs> it's Fair wonderful. Point. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> good point. Okay. <laughs> Although I, I, accept, I appreciate your compliment, but I think politicians honestly have a, a skill set that is utterly foreign to me. Oppressing the flesh, no. Yeah. But she will stay around later for some... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so he... But no, that... Well, the reason why I point this out about what he taught and how I fell in love with um, understanding what America is isn't and could be is because um, it informs what either directly or indirectly every day why I try to bring value to the work that I do now. So, Very true. Good point. Yep. Okay, let's look at another photograph here. This one. Oh yeah, that was also, that's, fifth grade was like such a pivotal year for me. I'm sorry, these are like all nerdy pictures from 1986, I think. Um, but that's me and like underneath the the, and the left-hand side with the big poofy purple jacket and the dark hair that you can't see. But this was a, a, a five-day long field trip that we took in the fifth grade back when we used to do those kinds of things. And it was all about uh, sites and uh, historical sites in the Pacific Northwest, and it was really awesome. Very cool. A couple more. Oops. Oh, yeah. Oops. Okay. This picture is in my bedroom. My mother gave it to me. And there on the upper left-hand side is my dad. There's my brother. You know, I have a younger brother, he's four years younger than me. There's me in the bottom left, and there's my mom uh, when she got her master's degree uh, in India at the age of 25. <laughs> and of course, you see what it says on the picture, right? The, a family creates a special bond of laughter and love that lasts a lifetime. The simplest family times are often the most fun. A family that plays together stays together. What's our version of play? <laughs> I love it. It's like a family that plays together by earning degrees stays together. Um, it's just like the most, most immigrant family thing possible. Um, and so I love this. I love this picture, but also in, in particular because of my mom. So do you mind if I just tell a quick, yeah, super quick ahead. story? So both my parents grew up very, very, very poor in India. Um, my mom grew up in, um, in Mumbai and loved math uh, as a young girl, but her parents couldn't send her to like the specialized, really fancy math high school. So she taught herself and did really well. And then um, essentially, long story short, that's when, she, that's a picture of her holding her master's degree in, in chemistry that um, essentially like she of her own volition and desire and of course, with the support of her family, they just couldn't give her material and financial support. Um, like, got very well educated. So I'm, I'm super proud of her. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's a fabulous story. Um, we have one more picture. There we go. Oh, yeah. This, this was just like, just a shout out to the 90s. Um, <laughs> because I was in this really small class of civil and environmental engineers, and I went to school in Oregon. And so you can see me in the upper left there with the um, flannel shirt, which in the 90s in the Pacific Northwest is like spot on. The uniform. Um, so, yeah, so the other reason why I like this picture a lot is I, another short story, is that okay? Um, you see, I have this clock constantly going inside my head. Like you, you, you end up getting very well trained about how long does one minute sound like, right? <laughs> I think we're, we're okay here. We're okay? Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, I, fe I spent my first two years of un my undergraduate experience um, at Stanford, and then I took some time off because I was just really laid low by some very severe depression, so I just couldn't keep going to school. Uh, and then I completed my undergraduate career at Oregon State University, which is located in the town where I grew up. And I can tell you that I believe my Second, the second half of my university experience was better than the first. I mean, Stanford's great, don't get me wrong, especially if you're a grad student. But in this picture, what you see is that woman down there at the bottom, Linda Peterson, who unfortunately I don't know where she is uh, now. But at Oregon State University, there was so much more socioeconomic diversity, so much more age diversity, so much more 
diversity of backgrounds in terms of life experience. And um, Linda was a single mom with two kids. She was working and going to school. Um, I think she was in her early 40s at the time. Wonderful woman. And you just really get a deep and profound appreciation for the value of education because you see people making sacrifices to get their education. And um, she was the best, best project partner because she was like, we have no time to waste. <laughs> we are gonna do an A job and we're gonna get it done efficiently because I gotta go pick up my daughter. Um, so anyway, I think that sort of more whole, more whole experience about not just the, you know, the science and engineering we were learning, but like, why does it matter in people's lives? Um, when you're 20 and 21, um, it can really change how you see the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. So then when you think about your background and your training, mm -hmm. and you think about someone in the next generation who wants to do what you do, which is pretty darn hard. Journalism is not the field that people are telling their children to go into these days. Like, what advice would you give to them? People Don't who... major in journalism. All right, why not? Because you should major in something that gives you a basis of knowledge, an area of expertise. Yeah, Journal been... Journalism is a, in my opinion, there are differing opinions about this, okay? Like I'm just, this is just me. Um, but I see journalism as a craft. It should, honestly, we should treat it as an apprenticeship, apprenticeship craft. Um, and we should invite people with, from all sorts of backgrounds and interests who have, who have a desire to sort of transform that into, well, how do I help other people better understand the world? And then we should teach them on the job. Well. Apprenticeships are really becoming a big thing yeah. again, right? There's a lot of movement towards that, away from necessarily thinking everybody should get a four-year degree, right? I'll, I'll add another thing, and this is this kind of like, ugh, part. Be prepared to suffer, because it's a terrible time to be a journalist, right? It's, there's no money in it. I'm, just total tea here. There's no money in it. Um, and the amount of opportunities are going down. Now, I am extremely lucky. Like I am an N of one in certain ways in terms of like the path that my career has taken. Um, and so I'm not saying that a young person who wants to do this should not, but it has to be your passion. And if you feel, if you, sorry, if you encounter a moment where you don't love it anymore, that's your escape. I mean, route. would you not recommend people go into this field? If it's your passion, do it. Yeah. Um, but if you try it and you discover it's not your passion, listen to that. So you've shared more about your background than I knew, and I really appreciate that. You know, this is important to know who you are as a person. Um, beyond the show and beyond your pathway, also I want you to kind of put in context for us what's going on in journalism, right? We have podcasts that have just proliferated to the point where, you know, everybody that you know has a podcast. And of course, maybe that's been good, for on point, because I certainly listened after the fact and do listen after the fact. There's print, which has been through the worst, you know, crushing turnaround. When you look at the landscape of journalism and you think about your part in it, where, like, what is your, you talked about this a little, you've alluded to where you see your part in it. How does it fit in this world of podcasts all over the place and, you know, platforms that people are blogging on all the time? Like, what's your, what's your brand and your niche for what you do? I have been asked this question before and I've never found a satisfactory answer. So I'm gonna muddle along and I'll, re I'll rely on my host to help shape a better answer. Um, so first of all, when someone wants to write a book, I mean, I, I presume there's probably a lot of people in this audience who have. No, seriously, like do you, th and this is a genuine question. Do you think like, okay, where in the field of books or this, this particular topic, will my book fit in before you do? Okay, and how, and how much does that like really determine whether or not you think it's worth writing? It doesn't determine at all? I mean, okay, so we have, I know someone in the audience who's written just a few books, my husband. Okay. And I think that, it seems like what you're getting at is, do people become very intentional in this or do they do something they love that develop that has value and then worry a little less about the whole range of what else is going on around yes. them? See, she should be a host. That's exactly what a good host would do. But 
So is that what you do? You say, look, I'm going to do something that I think is valuable, that brings a conversation people need to hear, and like to heck with the rest of it. Yeah, because when it first of all, I don't, I struggle with this term or even concept of brand. I don't really know what it means. I don't really know how, I don't think a journalist should Most ever apply it to, word, yeah. so I just don't know how to use that. Um, and then to your very well articulated point, there's just so much out there that if we thought about where we fit, we wouldn't do anything because there's something else that's doing it. There's probably 10,000 other programs that are doing it. So we just try our best to like, just do the best we can about the topic that we pick and hope that it works out. Well, that's refreshing. Not overthinking it, right? I mean, that's, that is a 98% answer the, in terms of like the um, intellectual and emotional thrust. The 2% of practical is that we're trying to be a show that like mixes reporting elements and live conversation. There's like sound in it, but it's not exactly a highly, highly, highly produced podcast because we have to turn one out every day. You know, so there's like those kinds of aspects which are which we try to use as differentiating aspects, but I don't actually really know if listeners even notice because I think what people only care about was, was that worth listening to? <laughs> it's a very immediate thing. Yeah. So in a minute, we're going to open it up because I know there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, I just want to ask you, what do you, knowing that you've had not a linear path, this is a trick question, what would you be doing next? Like, would you be moderating the presidential debates? Never. That would be awesome. Wouldn't she be awesome? You would get them to shut up when they're supposed <laughs> to shut up. I just think, I mean, for people who want to do it, bravo, go on. But those are like career killers. Or, they can be. Yeah. Well, do you want to, you know, I already ruled out running for office, but do you want to write a book? What do you want to do no. next? Okay. So I'm hitting. You're going to laugh when I say this. Here. You're going to laugh. Okay. What do you want to do? I would devote my life to FLL. <laughs> okay. <Who> so <laughs> does anyone okay. here know what FLL is? Oh my. Yeah. Do we have FLL too? First oh, Lego yes. League. Okay. No, you guys are going to think this is crazy. Okay. You, you're going to think this is nuts. Um, but I'm at the place in my life, and, and I say this with total gratitude for the path that I've been on and a recognition of my great fortune, that um, like, I love doing On Point and I will do On Point for as long as they have me. Do I want to go on TV? No. I just don't have any desire for that. Do I want to work at another radio station? No, because I like, love living in greater Boston. So like, this is good. I am lucky. So what would be next, per se? I think the next thing for me, years from now, because I still just need to earn an income, um, is something completely outside of radio. And I am the mother of two kids, and th through them, the experience of different ways of being connected to the community has been so profound, right, and so enriching. And I am a second-year coach for the first Lego Robotics League, woo! Um, and I will not spend the remainder of our time together talking about how much I love FLL, but the idea of helping young people um, be creative and experimenting and risk-taking, uh, is it's like thrills me. So I could do that for the rest of my life. We spent the whole evening. Notice how I like set up and like. Yeah, I was, I'm like, an alumni of FLL. No, <laughs> we talked about it at dinner because it's a really great program. Oh, can I? So. I'm so sorry. I'm doing this thing that guests do. I'm also sick about talking about politics. I think there comes a, to a point where, I, I mean, I have to like deliberately be engaged with it every day, and the futility of the engagement is getting to me. Wow. You no, know, seriously, like it's one thing. And I know, I, I'm guessing many, many people here are very politically engaged, and that's what we need. But I can never step back from it. And I'm telling you, it's killing my soul, because this it, it is just broken. Like, our politics are really very broken, and being in the media, we are contributing to that. And so, like, we're trying really hard to find ways to have conversations that actually don't contribute to the toxicity, but rather, like, sweep some of it away. But it gets increasingly difficult, and, you know, like, you just, your brain needs a break after a while. Oh, I think we can all attest to that, absolutely. Wow. We're really happy to have you. And now, I'm going to let people... Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, 
And I'm going to let people line up at the microphones to ask questions. And you can please tell us who you are before you ask a question. And you may have a lot to say, but we hope there is a question somewhere in there. <laughs> 280 character limit. Child yeah. accepted. <laughs> uh, my name's Ajay. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of first LEGO League. Uh, LEGO's got me into engineering. Um, I, had, I actually wanted to ask you about, um, like, there's this prevailing narrative of, of despair, like, about politics, about America, about the caliber of people you're speaking to at any given moment. And how do you approach that um, in your programming? Good question. So actually, that gives me a chance to clarify. I do not despair about America, but I do despair about some of our systems. And I actually want to say that in my mind, I can differentiate between the two because we make the system so we can change them. Okay? So, so um, I want to I want to clarify that. Uh, I think the way that I try to avoid feeling the despair or allowing it to overwhelm me is that as as if you're a regular listener to the program, you, you've noticed that even though we do do politics, we almost never do straight on politics anymore. Like the president said this, da 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 da, and so therefore blah. We just don't do that anymore because I just don't find it of use. Like I wouldn't want to listen to that. Because A, you could just pull up, oh, just look on your phone and you'll find more information faster than we could give to you on the radio. More information about what just happened. So what we do, what we try to do instead is like be like, well, why did it happen? And that's that simple question, you know, like there's the who, what, when, where, and why of journalism. Funny, the why is not actually asked all that often anymore, or not often enough. So we try to focus on the why, and that to me feels like, okay, well, we're not we're trying not to get sucked into the vortex, but actually understand a little bit more about like what's causing, what's causing that particular vortex. And, I, and that helps me feel, I say this over and over again, that we're at least trying to do something of use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Ringo. I'm actually also from Corvallis or Oregon originally. So Woo! go Beavers! Go Beavers! <laughs> um, and How did you end up here? Pardon me? How did you end up here? How did you end up here? Well, grad school. <laughs> uh, school on the East Coast yeah. and you get sucked into it. In any case, um, I really enjoy your program and I hear you about the polarization of politics and how it's so, so soul-sucking for all of us. And the title tonight was The Art of Conversation. And so I would love to hear some takeaways about just generally what you think makes a good conversationalist. Maybe staying away from politics is one of those ingredients, but just in general life, what advice you would give for people who would like to engage other people in sort of an interesting way and, and how you find that maybe what you just said about getting to the why in the last um, question was part of that. But Ingredients of a good conversation would be my question. And I love that you, thank you for the reminder of what we're supposed to be talking about tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great reminder that this is the art of conversation. So please, what are your thoughts on these conversations that we all have? Yeah, so um, it's funny because I don't consider myself an expert in this at all, although people have asked me this question several times. Um, I think... In my life, whether it's a conversation or a book or a Lego robot, if it's something I'm genuinely curious about, then my own pretense falls away. And once your own pretense falls away, so do your preconceived notions, so do your already hard form opinions. You can also like control your nervous system a little bit more so your heart rate doesn't, doesn't go off the handle. And to, to me, those, that's the most important thing about, am I going to have a good conversation with this person? And am I, am I genuinely curious about them? Am I genuinely curious about what they think? I may disagree with literally everything they say, but am I curious about why they think that? Yeah. So, I mean, I know that sounds like a really simplistic um, answer to the art of the conversation, but I don't want to... The, the phrase, the art of the conversation, to me, implies that there's some kind of, like there's like a priestly skill involved when I, I don't actually think there is. I'm sure we have great conversations all the time. I think we should slow down a little um, 
I'm saying this having like rambled on, <laughs> close our own mouths more uh, and just be curious about the other person. Um, and that's, that's the way in. And then what happens after that, I'm not sure. It just depends on, as you asked earlier, where does the conversation go? Yeah, by starting with curiosity instead of scorn, which is where a lot of oh, us... Oh, yeah, because like, would you want to talk to someone who, like, obviously scorned you from the start? Yeah. Like, Maggie, ugh. <laughs> right? Like, would you want to engage with, in conversation with me? Yeah. No, I think it's... You're right. It's a killer. So this is... I, I appreciate the question because I do want to say um, there is a... The vitriol is terrible right now. We all know that. Um, but sometimes the worst responses that I get from listeners have to do when we bring conservative voices on our program. Uh, one of the biggest avalanches of negative emails we got was uh, during the, uh, what year are we now? We're in 2023. So this is in, before um, the 2020 election. We did this long series of voter roundtables about different issues and like different places on the political spectrum. We did one with people who had voted for Trump in 2016 and what were they gonna do this next time around. Oh, I cannot tell you how many people wrote to us or social media to us and said, how dare you even put those people on the radio? Come on. So the idea that you can't be curious, have people on the radio, ask them their motivations, that was the third rail. The people who were listening weren't curious. That's what disappoints me. How can you not want to know why someone who was in the ICU for 12 days on a ventilator dying of COVID still thinks that Donald Trump is the great, is like, a, is a sent from heaven and she's gonna vote for him again? Don't you wanna know why? I feel like we need to understand that. I'm curious about that. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, and look, don't get me wrong. Like I just, I'm sure I'd get an equal number of horrible letters from people on the far right. They just don't listen to public radio as much. It's the truth. Um, but, but that to me is what, dis, what was disappointing. It's like, wait a minute, just be, at least be curious yeah. about your fellow American. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take another question here. Would you say something about Questions you very carefully do not ask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, that's a great question. He wanted to know about questions that I don't ask, that I do not ask. Like, they're very conspicuously don't ask. Um, so I would say that there's like kind of a boring area of questions which I don't ask, and that has to do, you know, like, um, if we're not there to talk about that person's life in particular, I don't think bringing family or kids is, is fair play at all. So I won't ask those. Um, other questions that I don't ask. Whew. I don't, you know, I think there are questions that I don't ask, but it's only because we ran out of time. <laughs> um, or, or, I'm sure everyone does this, like you've done a project and like, or you write a, an email and half an hour later you're like, oh, I should have put that other paragraph in, right? Like, so like for me, I spend the next 24 hours being like, oh, there were like six questions I should have asked, but they came to me later, unfortunately. <laughs> so. Yes, we all have that feeling. Do you try to surprise your listeners with questions that they're not expecting, which could be great, right? I don't know what they're expecting, right? Because I, no, because like, I don't know where they've, where they've, where they've done other interviews before um, or, or not. So it's hard to know what they're expecting. Yeah. Oh, we have people lined up over here. Let's ask a question over here. Hi, my name is Sarah. I, I love your show. I had a question about, <clears throat> so kind of in an academic circumstance or even just in, um, in general life, whenever kind of men talk a lot, they're like, oh, they're a leader. But I feel like there's still this situation where when women do, especially when you're younger, where you get called bossy or pushy or something like that, and it's just, it's not a fair Dynamic. We we heard you had this. Um, oh, that's never happened to you, right? <laughs> of, of just people just constantly trying to to talk over you. How do you how do you get around that? How do you kind of take back some of that power? Of like, yes, I do have something something powerful and something interesting to say that people should listen to. Um. So can you just repeat a, like really what you want to know? Because 
couldn't quite hear like the core of your question. Sorry, the, um, how do you kind of take back some of the power when you're, when you're speaking to people? Can you speak on kind of some of the discrepancies that you've had? Even you said there is no case when there was a woman who was talking over you, it's always a man. Um, so thank you for that question. The first quick part of that answer is a mechanical one. It's my show. <laughs> right? And I mean, at the end of the day, if I really want someone to stop talking, I just tell the engineer and he turns them off. <laughs> that almost never happens. We don't need to have that happen. But uh, I don't mean to make light of your question, but I'm serious. You're talking about sort of feeling a sense of power um, or, or um, knowing how and when to be inspired to take back the power. I never relinquish it to begin with. Okay, because it is, it is my show. And, and quite frankly, the people are coming into our space. They're coming into the, the world of our program. Um, and, and so the times that you heard there where um, someone didn't want to let me finish a question or they were accusing me of not a, behaving appropriately, it's very easy for me to be like, no, actually, I'm not gonna say you're wrong, but my, you heard, me respond to um, Shiva Yudurai. The last thing I said in that little clip was, it's my job. And for me, at the end of the day, that's always what I come back to. It's like, wh what am I getting paid to do right now? I am getting paid to be, I like to call it the listener's advocate. So if you, person X, are not answering the question, the, who you're really letting down is the person listening. And I'm the only one who can be like, please answer the question so that the two and a half million people listening will get an answer. So, um, so I think remembering what the space is, remembering that it's your space, uh, and then also, quite frankly, I don't know if this is good or bad, but like I've kind of always been obnoxious for my whole life. <laughs> so just like, I, I just like nerdy in a way that I didn't know I was nerdy. So you just like kind of like go and stuff happens. You're like, oh, that person reacted weird. Like I didn't expect that. I just wanted to know. Um, so I only say that because when people ask me this question, I'm actually somewhat at a, dis at a disadvantage, I think, in giving um, a really good answer because I never internally actually feel disempowered. So. The question is, for people who do, how to reduce that feeling of disempowerment at any time. And I think it's just to remember who you, know, who you are, all the reasons to be confident in yourself, to just acknowledge your humanity and be like, at the end of the day, you are DNA, flesh and bone. I am DNA, flesh and bone. There's really no difference between the two of us. So like, let's just get the theater over with and have a conversation. So just remembering that there is, it might not, it might not feel equitable at the moment, but it is. And you just have to assert that. Great perspective. Well, Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Gabriela, also an FLL fan. So for me, giving someone a active attention and biased attention right, is, is probably the biggest gift. And we don't do much of that uh, because we already have our positions on, on things. Here. So even if we're polite, right, we tend to be dismissive in a way. And so how many times someone on your show, right, really left you questioning your position? Oh, that's a great question. It has had definitely happened. For sure. Um, how many times I couldn't, I, I can't give you a number, but it has happened. Um, I mean they question or, your position in running, in leading. Are, are, is that what you're asking? Questioning or, or, your own position. Like you, you came with an idea and yeah. you left with that. Thinking something thing. else or maybe one or question or yeah. So, so how many times has someone on the show by virtue of what they said or our conversation led me to question my own position. Mm -hmm. That definitely has happened. Um, I, I think there are certain things which I'm pretty rigid about and I'm not gonna change, but other things which I was like, I hadn't thought of it that way. Or, you know, your experience that you shared with me is not one I could have ever imagined, so now it's, got a, it's making me wonder about, well, why did I presume the things that I did? So I actually have to say that that happens not infrequently. Let's take up, I think we have two more questions before we wrap up. Yes. Hi, my name is Jaya. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks to organizers for bringing my son and I 
big fan of modern love. So <laughs> we drove 15 minutes to see you. Um, I have two personal questions, and feel free to say you don't want to answer. So the first, um, you talked about your dad's reaction. How about your mom? How did, what did she say when you decided with all that engineering degree, <laughs> you are going to journalism? Why am I asking years ago when I heard you for the first time, my first reaction was, Bengali girl going into journalism? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because in my household, it's the other way around. My son is a brilliant writer, and he's an electrical engineer. Like, <laughs> what the heck you're doing? So <laughs> that was one question. And the other one, uh, do you want me to wait? or No, go ahead, go ahead. The other question, you did very slight hint of your mental health status. Yeah. 2016 was the year I decided that I needed to take a break from news. Mm -hmm. And I just did. And uh, it helped me in a way, but when you talked about it, and this is March month, every household which has a senior in the household, they're having the worst time of their life, you know, the anxiety and the, to know what is next. So you know how education is so important, and this is one of those towns. Um, how many parents ignore the importance of addressing the anxiety and depression. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I am building a community for special need parents from India. So I firsthand address that very uh, prominently. People just don't want to talk about it. Yeah. So what would you like to say to those parents? Yeah, good questions. Okay, so the first question was, what did my mom say <laughs> when I uh, went into journalism? So my mom's not much of a talker. My dad was like, you know, Bengali, just wanted to talk all the time. Uh, my mom's my mom's Konkani, so she's she communicates more through action and food. Um, but what she said was similar <laughs> to what my dad said. <laughs> Sorry, it just still makes me laugh. I love him so much. She'd say, at least she has her engineering degree to fall back on. <laughs> It gets even better because she said that for years, okay? And it's like 10 years after I, like, like 10 years after the last time I cracked open an engineering book, she'd be still like, at least she has an engineering degree to fall back on. And I'm like, I think technology and like the state of the art of engineering is so different in the, in the intervening 10 years that no one would even have me, okay? So I'm like, come on. Um, and to be fair, Again, I understand where they're coming from because science and the sciences and, and engineering, that was their path out of poverty. Um, and so, so yeah, uh, so there's that. And they, to be perfectly honest, she was right. But as soon as, you know, when I started doing work on the air, like I loved, I've loved every part of my journalism career and the first five and a half years was as a producer, so you never heard my voice. I was working for some, I was helping prep, prep um, someone else, and um, I loved it. But after I started doing work on the air, right, and people would call up my mom, be like, oh, I heard Magnus report on such and such. She'd be like, yes, yes, that's my daughter. Like, right? So it took like the social feedback of like, oh, maybe this won't all go horribly wrong for her to uh, come around. But um, <laughs> uh, anyways, so to your second question about sort of mental health. Um, I, I have to say that, you know, for my family in particular, speaking only in, in that context, but there may be some familiar aspects to it. You know, my, my parents were, for my whole life, they were very focused not just on like their children um, being successful Americans, but also continuing to build, you know, their lives uh, in this country. So I'm not sure they ever, and also given the culture and the time that they grew up in in India, that even like looking for signs of distress or anxiety or or struggle, mental health struggle in their kids is something that they would have ever even been attuned to. Um, and then on top of that, like I didn't want to let them down. And I think you know so many kids feel that way, and I have to say I hope I. Young people have a mental health challenge today, no doubt. I hope though that it's a little bit better that there are places they, it's not any better that they can go for help. 
I'm seeing one yes and one no. Um, so let me put it this way. Um, I think the only thing I can say for sure is that now as a mother myself, I still have that like tiger mom part in me, like she will never rest. But I also think, well, one thing that we can do generation upon generation is at least try to build from what came before, right? And so in terms of this aspect of mental health and, um, and certain communities, like I try to talk to my daughter especially a lot more have a lot more like a communicative relationship with her. So just at least to create the space where if she feels like there is something that she wants to talk about that she can, which is not necessarily something that I ever had with my parents. So I'm hoping for incremental improvement, but you can accelerate that for more people talking about it out loud in, in communities, right? So I'll tell you, 10 years ago, I would have never said what I said out loud in a, in a forum like this. But now I'm just like, what am I hiding? Like, come on, like everyone struggles. So, so I think that, for that those things help I a little bit. That. Yeah. Hi, my name is Margarita, uh, and a big fan. Um, my question is, uh, you mentioned um, a little bit about the curiosity uh, that helps you to uh, dig in a conversation that might be from a different perspective than yours. But sometimes when you are talking to people that might have personal traits or opinions that might be personally triggering to you, how do you prepare to accept and be open to different opinions um, and different opposing opinions? Per, so things that they might say that would be personally triggering for, to Correct. me. Correct, yeah. I'm only thinking because the things that trigger me are kind of like people just being dumb. Um, so, I'm at risk of giving an unpopular answer, okay? So I'm going to ask for everyone's forgiveness in advance. No, I'm serious. Well, let me first ask you, just for clarification, so I answer the right question. When, when you say personally triggering, can you give me a little bit more information about what you mean about that? Um, sometimes when two different opposing opinions come into a conversation, um, uh, uh, emotions tend to uh, take over uh, logic uh, so that we can carry a conversation in curiosity and openness of mind. But sometimes emotions can, can run high ahead of that understanding and block the rest of the conversation. So how do you keep calm so that the conversation can actually reach the, where we are trying to, to reach the other side? Okay, understood. Thank you for that clarification. Um, it's actually pretty easy because all I have to do is remember that it's not about me. It's about the conversation. So why would I be triggered? My, my presumption of what being triggered means is like something internally in me is reacting badly because it was meant at me. And very rarely, I mean, you heard the times where people were like, ah, you don't get it, whatever. But, but very rarely do people say things that I think are meant at me, okay? Now, people have said things which um, are challenging, let's put it that way. But again, you're asking about me. And it's because it's not about me, because it's about the conversation or about their opinion, I don't necessarily feel myself getting terribly flustered about it. And I think what I'm trying to say is, is that context matters and it would be a different story if I were like out on the street and someone were saying something to me directly. But in the context of, the, of a professional conversation on the radio, it's very easy for me to like take my own self-interest out of it um, and replace it with, well, what do we still really, what are we trying to get to? What do we need, what do we need to know? And I'm saying this after having done this for, for many years also, but I really mean it when I say like, just don't take it personally. Because it, unless the person's like, yeah, you suck, then like, okay, it's okay to take that personally. But, but that's just not how it works most of the time. 
And I, 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 I apologize if that's a, an unsatisfying, unsatisfactory answer, but. No, this is, this is perfectly, yes, this yeah. is perfectly acceptable. Um, I, I'm, I was particularly asking in terms of um, your personal views uh, when someone talks against them uh, during an interview. So um, you could be caught in a, in a situation where you personally feel um, more invested um, uh, in the conversation. That's, that's what I was trying to get at. But yeah. I, think, I think... Their personal views. Yeah, again, I think it's just like, this is my job, right? So there, there you, you have to maintain a level of professionalism and, in, and emotional detachment. Oh my God, my dad. Sorry, he just, <laughs> he's so informed everything that he, he was a super Star Trek fan and he said in his next life, he's gonna come back as a Vulcan. Um, but, but no, it's because he would always say, daughter, free yourself from attachment. Um, but, uh, but that's what I mean. It's just like, uh, yeah, people have said challenging things, but because I can just remove myself, literally, from the situation, then it, it's manageable. Thank you very much. That's been, it's been great to get a little window into how you think. I mean, I do think it's different. People are different from one another and your ability to have this conversation, to keep it out there and to do us all a service in doing that is tremendous. So I just want to have everybody take a moment to thank Magna Charter. Thank Rodney you for all. Out.